My, everyone, uh, can you hear us? Are you there? Can you hear us? Simon is here. <laughs> so Hi, just just here. in case anyone on the so so for everyone who's who's currently like, why is he so late? We were actually on good in good time. We were sat waiting, ready to press the button from 1957. Uh, sorry, 1857. And um, the problem is YouTube is becoming increasingly temperamental, uh, and it's just not. In, it's just not accepting the uh, the stream feed for whatever reason. So poor Simon's been sat here watching me mashing buttons like a lunatic. In any case, everyone, welcome to uh, welcome to Rail Matter. <laughs> Hello. Right. Well, just, just to prove that Simon is here, here he is. Hello, Hi, everyone. Hello. hello. Hello, Simon. How are you this evening? Are you well? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. How are you, Gareth? I'm all right. I'm all right. Uh, yes, I have... Um, Oh, actually, that's a good point. You are coming through quite quiet. Simon, tell us, tell us what you had for lunch today. If indeed, like me, you 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 had lunch at like five p.m., it should be fresh in your mind. Uh, what did I have for lunch today? Oh, I made one of my favourites, which is I made um, a halloumi omelette. Does anyone else do that? A halloumi a weird, omelette. Just make, just make an omelette and just good, wrap it around some halloumi. It's, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely. Um, so right, uh, there we are. Everything's here. We've I've, I've balanced you up a bit, so the sand should be fine. People cool. are here. Oh, my goodness me. Uh, for everyone who's been sat waiting in the chat for five minutes, I'm so sorry. I have tea. There. Nice uh, nice Scrabble mug there. There you go, Gareth. Uh, Simon, what are you drinking tonight? I've got some um, lovely red wine. That's some Italian. Very nice. It's What is it? Like, uh, is it a... Uh, it is uh, Montepulciano di Abruzzo, which I bought as a local Italian delicatessen. I, I, don't, I don't know why it's there, but it's amazing. They import everything from Italy. It's awesome. Love that. Um, so, uh, right, uh, lots of good chat on there. Uh, don't, if you're playing bingo, I've no idea what your, what your buttons are, but there are a lot of people who've been playing Rail Natter Bingo uh, for various reasons. I have no idea why. Anyway, good luck with that tonight for all those bingoing. Uh, right. In any case, let's... <laughs> we're five minutes in. Let's get cracking. So, um, so we must start with the news. Uh, and the first item of the news that we're going to be covering is uh, transport levels uh, for various modes. So as you'd expect, the outlook's pretty miserable at the moment for uh, for all public transport, to be honest, but particularly rail. Um, you can see very clearly with the spikes and the behaviours of... Um, in fact, let me get my old... Uh, let, me get, let me get yellow here. So so you can see since since lockdown happened, which is about here-ish, right? That was kind of the new lockdown. And, and sort of this period we've had... So between these two yellow squishes that I've put on screen... Um, is kind of we've had uh, kind of regional regional kind of uh, lockdowns and then here obviously is a huge drop because we had the national lockdown and that's kind of reflected in a couple of things firstly uh, that road usage has dropped a bit which it hasn't really been doing for a while but even regional lockdown you can see it's twisted the the percentages so this is just as a percentage compared to last year and you can see it was, it was up to 100 percent pretty much that's pitched downwards again um Likewise, with bus usage, pretty much mirroring that that behaviour, uh, and rail as well has just has just plummeted, as you'd expect it to, because we've theoretically had a big lockdown. Um, rail has been worse than flatline; it's been declining through this regional um, sort of the regional lockdowns, but you pretty much expect that. So essentially, it's only as we've had this the kind of the the uh, you know new lockdown regimes, uh, regional or national, that that rails pitched downwards again. Um, but you can see we're miles off the everything's going to be fine by the end of the year trend. That's uh, it's not happening. So there we go. Any thoughts, Simon? Um, it's interesting to see how sensitive um, the rail trends are to kind of the social distancy necessity, public health awareness type thing. So yes. it, it does suggest the idea that once social distancing isn't kind of required or it can be relaxed to some degree, that that perhaps that will um, will start to kind of poppy up again. But we'll have to wait and see, won't we? We have to wait and see, yeah. And, and, and that's, oh, there's no reason for, um, you know, to my eyes, there's no reason why we wouldn't have this traject this this kind of angle of trajectory, if not steeper, mm. um, post post. Uh, to be honest, I'd expect the trajectory to to be steeper, uh, if if kind of zero point here um, is basically once once the vaccine once we've reached critical mass of vaccine administration mm. uh, and things go back to some level of post COVID normality, this is just going to pitch upwards again. Um, Things will have changed. They will need to be receptive to what what dynamics have changed. But actually, to be honest, uh, and this kind of plays into what we're going to talk about tonight, the reality is that it's just going to afford the rail industry a brief bit of respite to deal with the mm. fact that we've been at capacity for a decade or two now, 
um, without building in any real extra breathing space. So really, this just off, you know, if, if there's a little bit more London based uh, flexible working that reduces the number of London capacity uh, uh, commuters, then that's basically just giving us a bit of breathing space to still mm. do all the stuff we need to do. Uh, a point often forgotten until the point where we're suggesting we close motorways. Um, until that point, we need to continue expanding rail capacity. Anyway, uh, COVID. Oh, you'll also notice the other response that shows lockdowns happening is cycling is pitched upwards again. Generally, this happens as, as, as you have, uh, likewise with the regional stuff, as you had local lockdowns, people started cycling again more. As normality returned, you know, back here, the cycling numbers were just returning back to 100% depressingly. So cycling it's depressing, again is quite, isn't it? My goodness. It's quite immediately responsive to, um, to, to basically traffic levels, I'd imagine, mm. uh, because when it's busy, cycling's horrible. Anyway, there we are, COVID. We haven't, we haven't really gone into detail with one of these for a while, so I thought I would. Um, here we go. go lots, of, um, lots of discussion. Uh, uh, no, it's not just because... So that's a good point. Romy Adekrat asks if this is based on a year-long average. No, this is to do with... This is like week-long. It's based on the, week, the previous week's average, uh, although the, the methodology changes a little bit between modes. So it's not... So that peak in cycling isn't to do with the summer... Um, uh, maxima, uh, you know, seasonality and it being nice weather, um, although there'll be a little bit of flux in that depend compared to what the weather was last year. But by and large, it's just related to a percentage compared to last year. So that peak in cycling really is, you know, twice the number of people cycling than did last year. Anyway, good question. Thanks, Romy Adekrat. Uh, oh, James P. I wonder if rail suffers on this graph because lots of rail op uh, operated at capacity while buses didn't. So social distancing has less impact on their capacity. James P. That is a very interesting observation. I have no way of validating that uh, suggestion, but it, it does sound feasible, actually. Rail was generally operating at capacity in lots and lots of places other than a few fringe lines here and there. Um, very, very good point. So so any reduction in ability to move people hits capa uh, hits the numbers hard, whereas buses... Yeah, that's that's that is an interesting one, James P. Good suggestion. Uh, anyway, moving on. It's Trans Awareness Week. Hooray! Hey. Um, oh, let's get our faces up briefly for this one. Let's 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 get the two of us up here. Um, we're we're here. Hello, we're waving again. Um, yes, it's Trans Awareness Week. It's also today um, LGBTQ STEM Day. So my favorite posts that I've seen, or I've not been on Twitter much to be honest. So they're like basically the the only kind of I went through the hashtag a bit. My favorite ones that I was seeing was the British Antarctic Survey. Um, all the way down in various spots in the the, the extreme ends of the uh, southern hemisphere, were um, were out waving the various flags, uh, the progress flag for one, and, and kind of the pride flag, oh. waving them uh, from like South Georgia and from the Antarctic. Progress quite... penguins, yes, yes, exactly. Um, so, <laughs> so that's quite good. Uh, yeah, and specifically worth mentioning um, the 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 progress train. Go onto the progress train website. Um, to find out, there's some great. There's a great video that's been put up there by Charlie. Um, lots of people collaborated on putting that together. Uh, it really talks about what Trans Awareness Week is about. Uh, yeah, so go in, have a check about that, a check up on that. Look at the hashtags and generally shout and scream about these positive things. Um, yes, Simon, anything else to say on that? No, it's uh, been amazing to support and uh, raise awareness um, for really important issues. So um, yeah, share and get involved and read up and ask your friends and tell everyone there's lots of good uh, from 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 my perspective certainly there's lots of good stuff um about being a good ally not just mm. you know not just a good um broad ally but how to specifically be a good ally given that it's trans awareness week how to be a good ally to trans people um yeah I, and that's the, that generally for me is always the most informative it's it's what what can i do what look uh, frankly tiny little totally minuscule things can i do that make a real difference to to trans people um uh yeah so go and check out the resources pronouns. the hashtag uh, <laughs> pronouns are a very good start yeah um yes so get 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 stuck in go and have a look um next what's the next thing the next thing ah oh, the news uh, so right, I'm going to get rid of faces just so I don't forget that they're there uh, because they're, they're blocking my car. And right, here we go. So, combustion engine car ban from 2030. This is exciting, isn't it? Um, I mean, it's only what was in the Labour manifesto. In fact, he, Boris is coming out and talking about uh, Bojo's, uh, in his infinite wisdom, is talking about the this what he's de he's describing as a green industrial revolution, which is precisely nicked straight out of the Le Le Labour Party manifesto. So once again. Uh, Labour Party policy gets nabbed by the um, 
by the opposite side. In any case, uh, no, this is a partisan podcast. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the, the combustion engine car ban, petrol and diesel cars, new ones banned from 2030 onwards. This is a no-brainer. Like, come on. What, like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, an absolute no-brainer. It, it, it puts a bit of um, a jalapeno up the tailpipe of the car industry to sort of make more of a point of shoving more electric cars out there. But also it makes people think a bit more sensibly about the alternatives as well. Um, yeah. Although rather depressingly, Boris has put a piece together in the FT where he talks about all trains being powered by like hydrogen and synthetic fuels. <sighs> so, um, yeah, don't read too much into Bojo's rhetoric, frankly because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Anyway, so, uh, you know, which is great, right? Government knows what it's doing, and it has a coherent policy on climate change. So mm. I'm sure it does, right? Yeah, definitely. Mm. Oh, nope, because Treasury is also simultaneously increasing rail fares again, despite everything that's happening, and the fact that the whole point of having uh, a rail fare system that is as commercially competitive as the UK's, or GB's rather, is that it can reduce fares to bring people on and manage demand. And yet, the moment when that is the perfect time to be doing that to encourage people back onto the railways uh treasury like nana nah, we, we don't want to risk you know losing money like what what do you mean losing money there are no what people money? traveling and paying for fares so uh yeah they're increasing rail fares again uh so this this makes me very angry uh simon how, how do you feel about this particular uh bit of joined up policy uh you know we all most of us with our heads screwed on uh in the industry know that the this is the perfect time to do what we've always wanted to do which has been the current fair system which was set in stone in the 90s when it got privatized and unable to be changed properly yada 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 bin it and start again and all the treasury can think of is but 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 money not realizing that there's no but 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 people so yeah it's just absolutely insane i mean uh i mean obviously you know uh, hashtag abolish the treasury uh, we just need to get rid of them. This needs to be a non-governmental non-government, organization with zero power, um, or at least uh, maybe like 1% of the power it currently has. Uh, because frankly, it's you know it's stuck in, this, in the 1500s and has no interest in, uh, in actually moving our country forwards. Uh, it's just uh, very, very frustrating. As you say, with, with fares reform, like it's just the perfect time to do it. It's the absolute perfect time to do it. The Treasury have always stood in the way of things. They were very, very upset at the idea of... Um, uh, ticket splitting becoming a mainstream thing. So they very much were upset when uh, certain major groups, um, uh, shall we say, uh, put the... that on their website <laughs> yeah. uh, and allowed it to be streamlined as a process rather than it just be, but being a bunch of like third-party HTML3 yeah. websites. But I could also say that with the fares thing, just remember, just to, just to really wrap up the point with the Treasury, they don't realise that as things stand, it is cheaper to buy a 12-month season ticket than it is for someone to travel nom- no- notionally 48 weeks of a year for two, three times a week. It is more expensive to travel on any time fares two or three times a week than it is to buy a whole 12-month season ticket, which is bonkers. It's just it's just completely bonkers. Like the, the complexity of the system, yeah, it just needs tearing down. Like There are advantages to complexity because it means that you can have expensive you can have responsive fares you can have uh, fares that are expensive for walk on and cheap for advance which is which is actually good because it means that overall you get a cheaper fare um for people who can who can kind of plan ahead a bit more but that is sort of math there's complexity and then there's what the hell we've got and this is the opportunity to change it anyway i'm sure there are lots of people there are lots of angry people in the chat um uh, yeah the classic truism as chris jackson points out which is that the treasury knows the cost of everything the value of nothing Mm. Um, yes, indeed. Hence the need to abolish them. Anyway, right. Talking of uh, sustainability and sustainable transport, uh, which is what we're going to talk about. We're, we're tonight. We're, we're doing it. Why have I put this picture up? Well, this is a picture of. Do you know what this is actually, Simon? Do you recognise this? Other than um, it being a bit of old track. It's familiar and it may have been something that Tim posted, but other than that, I don't know. Uh, possibly. Well, this image is from one of Trevithick's earliest tramways, ah. actually. Gotcha. So it's one of the oldest bits of extant P-way, in exi- uh, kind of modern P-way-ish, modern-ish. It's actually a plateway rather than a, a, a track as, as we know it. But as you can see, you can recognise some switches and cro- or a switch and crossing there. Um, actually, mm. the switchblade's slightly out of shot at the top because, you know, uh, Reasons. Aspe- aspect ratios. Um, but if, if it's, you know, this is 200 years old, 200, mm. actually it's more than that, it's 218 years old. So presumably that means that railways are pretty sustainable, right? If they're still going... Um, or or does it? I think we're going to unpick that a bit uh, in in tonight's episode, aren't we, Simon? Yes, yes, we are. Yeah. So, without further ado, um, let's crack on with tonight's rail matter. Uh, 
Uh, the lovely in City 225. Hopefully Simon gets to hear Ivor the Engine, actually. Did you hear any of that, or did you just see the orange? I heard it all. Hooray! It used to be that guests didn't get to hear it, but um, yeah. now they can, which is nice. So they get to experience yes. the, the intro. Um, uh, anyway, so um, here is a picture. What What is this picture of? It looks a bit green. What's going on here, and what, what are you trying to evoke, Simon? And while you tell that, I'm going to make your face appear. Oh, lovely. We're here. Hello. Um, yes. Um, so this picture, I believe this picture is of one of my favourite bits of abandoned railway in the world, um, which is um, La Petite Ceinture in Paris. Um, I think this is one of the bits on the southern side, which because I was um, not, I didn't do my research before I went there. I, I didn't actually work out how to get into this bit. But there are various bits that you can get into, some more legally than others. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's, you know, the, the fences and stuff are very French. I either just leave it open and go whatever um anyway the point is is i wanted to use a kind of visual metaphor to kind of highlight that uh, railways are are green and, and and what we mean by by green is that they're a very efficient way of moving people and things around we can cover either short distances in cities for things like commuting um that includes things like trams and they're also very good for moving things incredibly long distances um, if you take your, for example, run-of-the-mill Trans-Siberian Railway. Um, so the railway, despite being a technology which, as you just showed before, is incredibly old um, in many respects, it's kind of a continuation of, of various ways that humans have transported themselves. And I think that as, I think this is quite pertinent in the times of, in the, times of the COVID, um, yeah. that, that we talk about, that we realise that there is an... In, an endemic part or a fundamental part rather of our human nature which means that we move around absolutely um, and yeah yeah and, and it's yeah i, I mean it's something that i bang the drum as a p engineer it's something i bang the drum of a lot obviously um and it comes down to a few fundamental principles but one of them is the principle of load transfer which i'm sure i've mentioned to people which is about the fact that steel on steel and to an extent it was iron on iron in the past with with similar um kind of similar effect but steel on steel because the strength of that material is very high, you can have a lot of load transported through a very small contact patch. So the contact patch under modern train wheels is about the size of a five pence piece, which I don't have. I used to have a five pence piece at easy access. Anyway, um, about the size of a five pence piece or your thumbnail or something like that, uh, depending on how petite your fingers are. In any case, that means that friction is really low, which is why it requires so much less energy to, to move lots of stuff around. Um, and also momentum and all sorts of other things. But the principle of load transfer is the key one. So the ability to, to kind of have a very high strength interface between the wheel and the rail and then manage those loads into the ground without, you know, sort of sinking down into infinity gives you a very, a very strong and a very energy efficient system. Um, yeah. So before we talk about anything more, and I'm going to mm. casually just slide into OBS and bring your face up. Simon, mm. tell us. So, so, so we, clearly you have a passion about, about railways. Um, we, it says here that you're a railway manager and sustainable transport uh, advocate, although I've written nut because advocate's quite a long word. Um, and uh, so tell us about yourself, Simon. Why, why railways? Why, why did you get involved in railways? And what do you do? What, what, is your, what can you tell us about your day job as well? Yeah, so um, pretty much my first memory ever was, was I was about two, three years old, very, very small. And my dad... He, he loved the trains as well. He took my brother and I out on the trains a lot. So, you know, blame him. Um, but my, my earliest memories were standing at the, if anyone's familiar with Harrow and Wealdstone mainline station, which is where I was near where I was brought up in northwest London, um, on the Bakerloo line, so on the platform one side, there was a small ticket office, still there today. Dad was getting tickets. There was the old Network Southeast red ticket machines, with the buttons, and the money would fall out, and it would sound like you'd won the jackpot. It was fantastic. And I saw little tiny me, saw this BR blue, 87 putting some assortment of, of uh, mail vans through the fast platform and it was thrilling and terrifying in equal measure and that was pretty much it i was pretty much hooked from that moment onwards um all through my all through my school years apart from some teenage rebellion where i decided to get reinterested in supercars um to kind of reject everything from my childhood but i, I soon came back to rail i had no idea what i was going to do in terms of industry stuff but when i got a bit older i i got reinterested in in uh, traveling around europe I went to the Netherlands a lot, went to Denmark. And um, what's nice about those countries, which we'll get into a little bit, is how they have very really nice um, active infrastructure. And so I realized um, that rail is really good sustainable mode of transport and biking is another one. So I kind of want to 
try and in my day job work in the railway so now i'm working for network rail and i work in freight um so i'm kind of part of network rail's freight interface and basically my job is to manage the freight interface which is quite complicated between the network rail infrastructure the routes and the operators and the freight operators and the end users and all sorts of other stuff going on um and try and get more freight on rail and i'm responsible for the southern region so obviously it's got southampton and the channel tunnel on yeah. it which is about to get interesting. Um, so that's what I'm doing at the moment. And then in the kind of outside of that, I'm part of the Young Rail Professionals, um, which we'll get to. And also I am, uh, yes, as I said, very, very interested in sustainable transport because basically we should be able to transport ourselves around and do our day-to-day -day business without much impact on the environment or very little, which is, uh, which is partly what we're going to be covering soon. Surely. Yeah, given we're 21 minutes in, we will get there eventually, yeah. Um... Yeah, it's interesting. So I was working with your predecessor, I'd, I I would imagine, on uh, a, a fair few years back on doing a few freight gauging projects around mm. from London Gateway. So, um, uh, but through London Gateway, but that bit's eastern region, but it comes yep. down through uh, your patch um, mm. uh, on it, on its various shenanigans, uh, left, right and centre. So, yeah, lots of I'm sure at some point we'll have a freight gauging episode or maybe I'll pick a project and we'll talk about it and, and why actually I love freight gauging projects because more <laughs> than passenger stuff you get a feeling for what um, you get a real feeling for what benefit you're having because you know mm. you know how many lorries have been taken off the road by your you know extra six paths a day you've created on that on yeah. that given route or something like that or um, yeah absolutely love that uh, Paul mm. Prentice is shouting hooray for the southern region um, uh, well, so uh, well, God help them they might if it might be me managing it <laughs> So yeah, thanks for that intro, Simon. That's I think everyone's got a bit of a nice, well-rounded picture of uh, of what you get up to. And I'm sure we'll touch back on, on a few of the things you talked about. So uh, let us continue on our adventures. And actually, we're going to start with the definition. Um, mm. I, I, Bruntland. I, where did yes? I, I'm trying to work out what voice I should do to read this out. <clears throat> I'm just going to do it in my posher voice because. Um, yeah, yeah. No, it's all right. <laughs> Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Uh, and that's from the Brundtland Commission in 1987. So what does it tell? Unpick that quote for us a bit. Um, yeah, with pleasure. So um, basically, um, if you study planning in any capacity, which is what I did, this is one of the first things you're going to be kind of faced up with. Um, so I've done two degrees, one of which was uh, town planning. Um, so this is city planning, urban planning um, in other countries. And I did that at Liverpool University. And the second master's I did was in when I was living in, in Denmark for a few years. And I did one called Sustainable Cities, which is like an environmental engineering kind of degree. Um, but we'll get to that. Now, either way, whether from the UK or from kind of a, a European perspective, um, you talk about sustainability a lot. And um, when you talk about sustainability and the way it's introduced is always with this quote, which is from the Brundtland Commission in 1987. It's a really interesting report because it shows that in the 1980s, the consensus was kind of pretty much coming together pretty solidly then of going, the human activity is causing massive problems to the climate and will cause big problems. And here we are, what, 33 years later going, hmm, it's getting a bit hot now, isn't it? Um, so... It's interesting how we've recognised this for such a long time, but as is often the case with humans, unless we, unless the kind of what's on around us is like on, on fire, fire, pretty yeah, much on fire, yep. We don't really act. We're great in a crisis, um, but it's a shame that when it, we have that kind of what Roger Ford, I believe, calls the boiling frog syndrome, which is you know <laughs> if you throw a frog in boiling water, it will jump out, but if you put it in cold water and heat it up, it doesn't really realise that it's boiling yep. until it's too late. Um, so this is this is um, the, the fundamental idea of of making sure that what we do going forward is a means that the, the, we leave the world and essentially the better place than we do uh, do when we find it. Um, and that informs lots of planning policy in the UK. So it, impl it informs something called the NPPF, a very dry document called the National Planning Policy Framework, which I will not mention anymore. Um, it is but, worth picking through it, though. There's, it is worth picking through the NPPF. Like, it's, um, yeah, it's... Uh... It's, not, it's not exciting, but there are some things in it. And I think one of the key things, again, is, is it's this idea of sustainable development. And basically, with regard to approving planning applications, they'll say things like, we will approve things um, we'll, we'll approve things that are fitting in with this idea of sustainable development, which links into this definition. Um, and so my interest is always in how how does that relate to transport? And that's that's yeah. kind of where I, where my dissertations went and stuff like that. Which is, which is then where uh, we've pulled in this quote, which is... Um... 
essentially saying that sustainable transport is satisfying current transportation and mobility needs without compromising the ability of future generations. Well, you get it, future generations to meet these needs. Uh, and this is actually from a piece, this is from the Journal of, uh, I think it's from the, the Journal of Transport Geography in 1996 uh, with the author William Black. So he essentially just took the logical leap, which is explaining what sustainable transport is, mm. which is what you and I, bo- we both call ourselves sustainable transport advocates you know, yeah. activists, campaigners, whatever you want to uh, describe us as. But that's what we thats what we both do. And, and it's essentially the same idea, right? Yeah, absolutely. Excuse cool. me, that's a top up on my wine. That's fine. So, we, yeah, we, we, we want to be able to move people around now without stopping people in the future being able to do the same thing, which means, I mean, a variety of things, which I'm sure we're going to get into. Mm. People often immediately jump for the... Uh, jump for greenhouse gas emissions but i think as i'm sure you're about to explain there is more to it than that so um Mm -hmm. yeah so if we skip so right okay a very sideways step onto Mm. this uh leaflet from metroland so i'm gonna audio describe what's on because i need to yes oh yes do that um metroland price two tuppence it says on, on here in some rather in rather quaint uh text and there's an old wilkinson sketch of um of what could be mock tudor but could be also normal Tudor with trees and looking generally, if it's Metroland, the assumption is there's a lot of mock Tudor going on. Um, but, it, you know, it's a, it's a nice green area and it's it's it's, adver- it's clearly beckoning it's beckoning for someone to come and, and inhabit this place. Uh, but tell us about this leaflet and why you've popped it in. Yeah, so um, it's, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, Metroland is, if you're in London, is, is probably where a lot of people brought up i think tim was brought up in a different part much, of, yeah, yeah. of metroland so that's where i was i was brought up so i was brought up in this 1930s suburbia my house uh, that i was brought up in which is still where my parents live was built in 1934 and it was built near to the uh, stanmore branch of the metropolitan line which became the bakerloo in the jubilee and the metropolitan railway did a very clever things where they would buy up the land nearby and sell it at a kind of a profit to the uh, railway companies to uh, get people out of the smoggy dirty city um and cities grow. Um, the, the urban population has, for the last kind of 150 odd years, basically since the Industrial Revolution, the urban population has just massively increased. So there's what I mean by that is that there's more and more people have been moving from rural areas into cities. And probably the most extreme example of this is in Japan, where this is happening so much that the kind of rural areas are literally dying because mm. all the old people are just dying in places where then no young people live or bring up families because they all want to live in the in the cities. But in um, most parts of the world, urbanisation is, is, is a thing. And that's why it's a very interesting, uh, necessary uh, thing to do is to talk about um, how we move people around cities, how we get them functioning, how we link cities and also how we link our uh, rural areas. So it's it's a, a lot of sustainability is, is is about those things. It's not just about green issues. It's also about how people live their lives and not yeah, necessarily the social yeah the thing. social uh, element the the, the impact exactly. on communities yeah exactly so that's that's the kind of the the kind of the the, the metaphor of metroland is that you know in a, in a sense we all in some way if you live in an urban area you you live in some kind of metroland you'll have to interact with some kind of transport and that will have some kind of socioeconomic impact on you and how we plan for that is what i call sustainability and why i think that we need to have this discussion that sustainability is perhaps more than just thinking about greenery absolutely green yeah yeah and it's uh, and it's interesting we talk i often get a lot of pushback from people who um i had a very surreal interview uh, a while back with a, a, a someone who was putting a video together about high speed two actually and mm. i was making the point that we need to um we need to grow the capacity of of, of our urban transport networks because um, people living in cities is good. It's good for a, 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 from an environmental perspective because you minimise sprawl. Um, it's good for uh, you know having a particularly medium and high density housing. It's just it's good for social cohesion because actually uh, the community exists in a different way to what it did you know a hundred years ago or fifty years ago even. And that it's not just one street and people all speak to each other. Now the community exists virtually and people use public transport to then come and, and meet collectively. So yeah. communities exist just as they did before just in a in a different way uh, and cities yeah. enable that by having urban transport and, and 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 that social cohesion is really important and um, people just you know you can walk very easily walk or cycle to everything you need to do when you're in an urban area so so to, to a large extent the sustainable transport what we often call active travel so walking uh, uh wheelchairing cycling scootering 
these things all allow you to get around a city or an urban area much more easily than you know riding an e-scooter from uh from hawes down to northallerton is um, is not quite as straightforward as doing it from i don't know york mm. way across the town to uh, you know buckingham palace um you can tell i was watching the, the crown recently because that's the only two London ah. places i could think of in any case um yeah so so yeah absolutely it's just it, it's about that social element and and and, and I, the, the interviewer was pushing back and saying does that mean you just want to bulldoze the countryside to build more cities He's like, no the whole point is that actually from all sorts of perspectives it means that you can essentially stop bothering the countryside by having people uh living in, in urban areas making use of the urban area space that we already have mm. um yeah so it, so lots of interesting yeah there, there are lots of interesting tran kind of transecting concepts about how we live and what because there are certain there are certainly certain factions um across society not just restricted to the to green campaigners and the green movement but right across the board who sort of want us to live in a little Cotswoldian idyll and, and, and in their head that's the most sustainable way for us to live but Which that's also it... so bad because there's this other thing and, and i remember this from this was second year uni in liverpool when we did a trip to the lake district and it was the rural planning module mm. and we were driving through this beautiful lake, lake district scenery you've got you've got you know the kind of the, the, the that part of the country you know you're living up in the northeast you've got these rolling hills and this and the dry stone walls which still blow my mind because how do dry stone walls stay together it's such a mystery um and you've got the sheep and all the rest of it and my professor just kind of dryly is a very dry chap um called dave and he said he said, you see all this, it's all industrial. This might Absolutely. as well be a factory. There's just the difference is it all looks nice and green. But when you see farming, whether arable or pastorals, whether animals or crops, it's a completely, utterly human-generated, managed and impacted industrial landscape that happens to look pretty, which is why you get lots of people who seem to look at green fields that say a new railway line like a high speed two might go through and they call and they call for you know Boris Johnson's head on a stick um or whatever or our heads on sticks because we are the paid shills um apparently um but <laughs> in reality they're actually cutting through a industrial landscape and as you say you quite rightly said if we're actually focusing on sustainable urban living then actually we can leave more of the countryside alone and let it rewild and do its Absolutely, thing nature yes. will do its thing if you leave it alone it, indeed so yeah it's, it's it's a common point and i actually recorded a skit of a, a short clip of video that i intend to use at some point of me running out into some Scottish wilderness and sticking my hands up in the air because I wanted to make the point that even in the most, uh, even the Scottish wilderness, you know, up in the, in the Highlands, mm -hmm. even places as barren as probably this, this, the last great wildernesses of, of, of kind of Noidar or Rannoch Moor are mm -hmm. industrial landscapes. They're post-industrial. You know, the, the, the sheep have obliterated what used to be the Caledonian forest. You know, those little little islands in lochs that have trees on them are what the whole of Scotland used to look like. We have totally, the whole, not a blade of grass, uh, really, in this country uh, is untouched. You know, the whole place is post-industrial. And yeah, we need to, and enabling, you know, as, exactly as you say, if we can pull people into urban areas, that's good for um, essentially mm. rewilding, allowing the, allowing the natural parts of the country to return to such. Mm. Any case, uh, in any case, let's um, skip forwards on to the next slide yes if uh if you please ah so talking of which ah. here are some active traveling people some people yes they are so this is um so i think there is a danish person um who who joins the rail natter so uh, yes can you see hi today with your with your mill put it here rail natter oh um, here he is yeah, so I lived in, in Denmark for five years. In fact, this calendar year, is this is a very sad thing. This calendar year well, looks like it will be the first calendar year since 2008 that I haven't been to Denmark in some capacity. Oh. That's how long my association goes back to. I first went there in 2009, and I lived there for five years. So I've only been back in the UK for just over two. Um, so this is the Dorning Louise's Bro, or the Queen Louise's Bridge. And what's notable about this bridge, it's probably one of the most famous kind of cycling bridges in the world because it's the the bike lanes is like the widest part of the bridge and the road bit is just about wide enough for like a bus to get through mm. um but the bike lanes are super super hench um i couldn't find quite a picture of the the junction at the other end on the city side where you have this massive cycling junction with huge boxes and you can do these kind of crazy hook turns and all this kind of cool stuff um so i've briefly lived in this area um although i actually spent most of my time living in the south um of the city but the point is is that active travel um if you provide the infrastructure 
is possible and it is possible anywhere this is copenhagen and what and the same goes for amsterdam what people say is but copenhagen's flat and amsterdam is flat and it's like well yes th- this is true but did you know that in oslo which is not flat no. <laughs> or particularly warm in the winter and very snowy they've been promoting cycling a lot of people are scratching their heads but combined with in oslo city center which i did a uni project on um which is the fact that they are banning cars from the city center ripping out parking spaces like there's no tomorrow um and putting in uh, lots of bike infrastructure and guess what cycling is increasing even in oslo where the temperatures can be i don't know on a, a balmy winter's day is like minus 10 or something yeah. Yeah. aren't they um, aiming for net aren't they aiming for zero fatalities as well in oslo is that the city yeah. where and yeah, that's part so it's part of this wider view of of, mm-hmm. uh, of of essentially bring opening roads people often say closing mm-hmm. roads no no opening roads back to people yes. rather than two-ton boxes exactly so um, in Copenhagen, um, about six, I don't know what it's like now with COVID, but you know, pre-COVID, it was you know, about 60, 65% of people going to work or to, to educational establishments mm. were traveling by bike in the, in the Copenhagen metropolitan area, um, which is pretty incredible. And also this includes teenagers, kids and stuff like this. And this is where, this is one of the amazing things about, about cycling or just active infrastructure is it democratizes space. Yep. So if I, I don't know what it's like for you, Gareth, where you live, but where I, I, I live on a, on a, on a bus route in, in, in Tottenham. Um, so, and because it's like Haringey, there's lots of on-street parking. There's no like driveways and stuff. Cause my house dates from when the great Eastern built the line to palace gates. Um, so because of that, you'd stand outside and we've got our like lovely bike hanger where, where, where my bike is parked. Um, but then the rest of the space there is, is, um, for cars and it's, they pay a pittance to the council yeah. to put their car there for 12 months, a car that sits there for 95% of the time doing absolutely no, absolutely nothing. Mm. Um, and it's it's the privatisation of public space, which is something that I uh, kind of makes my blood boil. Um, but biking infrastructure and walking infrastructure literally gives space back to people. Mm. And it's such an efficient way. And I like it when you, know, you and I see people saying, see things on Twitter, like, oh, look, the railway line's not doing anything, or oh, the bike lane's empty. It's like, yes, that's what efficient transport infrastructure looks like. It's just stuff going past. It doesn't look particularly busy because it's working. Yeah, um, this is it. Yeah, yeah. So that's the thing. And what you want in somewhere like you know, in somewhere like Denmark, is that you know a lot of people have in the Scandinavia this kind of um, second house, like in the countryside, like a small like a uh, little hut. So my friends um, that I used to visit that have what they call a little hooda, like a little hut or like a bothy type thing, like yeah, up in Scotland. Mm. Um, and my friends had one right in the west of the country in Jutland. And so basically you could, I could bike to the train station, get on the intercity train, it would then split into different bits. And I might have to change once, but sometimes you get direct train, get off with my bike and then just cycle the rest of the way. And my carbon footprint has been, well, just nothing basically just powered by my breakfast and a train. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I was just, I, I was waving my arms around because I realized where this is. There's a famous intersection uh at where all these cyclists are going that i think finds its way into lots of like brent Tadarian sort of videos yes or, it does and it's, it's just like this mad chaos of cyclists whizzing in all directions it's um, beautiful it's and so there, lovely uh, and there are problems with uh accessibility for disabled people with certain you know in certain that intersection is often cited as not actually being great for people who, who, who are kind of got mm-hmm. a bit of blindness or but those are the those discussions are much easier to have when you are also not negotiating with two ton wheeled boxes yeah. whizzing around. Yeah, exactly. you can start understand. It's a it's a happy problem to have if you like, in that you can mm-hmm. then start understanding what what suits what suits everyone, because a collision then is much less likely to cause harm, whereas a collision with a a, a mm-hmm. vehicle doing thirty or a car doing thirty is is very likely to do harm. I had in all the five years I lived in Copenhagen, I think I had one time one time where a driver didn't see me and an intersection that wasn't really a, didn't have a very good bike lane in it mm. um where the driver didn't see me and almost hit me and that was one time and that was it and it was pretty late in the day and you know i shouted at him and he swore at me and we went on went on our day um <laughs> but um at one time in five years given that i feel that in london when i go and cycle the rare occasions that i do it's just a case of you know when am i going to have a problem rather than if Absolutely, yeah. So, so yeah. So that's um. So it's that's a nice uh, excuse for to step over into weirdly. So okay, a couple of things I'm noticing in this picture. So we've skipped over. So the previous picture was a nice bridge with lots of people cycling on it, with some very uh, Danish-looking uh, structures in the background. It's very nice. Um, the next picture we've got is of the Gotrain in uh, in South Africa. Am I right? Yes. 
Yes. Um, now, this is interesting for a variety of reasons. Number one is that that is uh, the body of uh, an electrostar, uh, number one, mm-hmm. um, which is you know potentially interesting to people. You know, mm. We're exporting a train, which is nice. Uh, number two is that the company I used to work for did the design for this. So there are some. I, I, I've, I've looked at some of the bits and pieces uh, related to design work off this, which is quite interesting. Uh, and number three is that you can see a nice platform with some yellow uh, sort of tactile stones uh, keeping people away from the from the platform edge, uh, mm. and also some fast clip, some pandrel fast clips in the bottom, so you can tell the British companies have the involvement of design. Anyway, so that's that's oh, my outline picture of this bronze and yellow uh, electric train. Tell, mm. and it also looks like saying Hatfield uh, in the in the at the front, which is confusing. I don't know. Is there a Hatfield in uh, in there is. at Joburg? Is this yep. in Joburg? Where which city oh, is Godfrey? Uh, almost. So this is actually Pretoria. That's in Pretoria. Okay. Which is the point of the line. Um, so I'm sure everyone's wondering why on earth we've segued from kind of London to Copenhagen to uh, suddenly to, to South Africa. Um, and I, I understand the confusion. So um, <laughs> as part of my master's that I studied when I was in Copenhagen, um, I my master's project was about this question of really getting to this kind of nuts and bolts of, of, of this question of sustainability. So I wanted to kind of stress test this concept of sustainability and particularly sustainable transport why, more widely, uh, as we were talking about before, uh, over and above this kind of green carbon issues to more about the socioeconomic issues. And, mm. and um, so this is the perfect opportunity because um, in, well, first of all, as my friends were getting married in Johannesburg, so that was, that was, that was quite handy. Um, but also um, it was a chance to go and check out this railway line they've built there. Um, so it is a Bombardier designed and built or the production series were the pre-series were built in Derby at Litchurch Lane. Mm. Um, and then I think they, I think they then, I think they, they sent the bits out to be assembled. I was going to say as a standard for a contract, it meant that they could employ some yeah. people locally to put them together. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, this line uh, connects Johannesburg to Pretoria because these two cities are actually about 30 miles apart. And then just outside Joburg, um, there is the OR Tambo Airport, which I think I'm right in thinking is the busiest airport in Africa. It might be it's either that or Cairo. Um, it's, it's getting all the there. facts, ladies and gentlemen, and, and boys and girls, and everyone else. I try. Well, I mean, that, uh, someone probably in the chat will probably say, "No, it's wrong." Yeah, you're about to be corrected, I'm sure. Yeah, anyway, exactly. There you go. It's, uh, I don't have the safety of being in the chat anymore. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so they built this line and I was really interested in why. So partly it was built for the 2010 World Cup, which I know was, was 10 years ago, which is long enough, but it feels like about 100 years ago uh, back in the days. Um, and I went down there to kind of talk to the, the people that were running the, the, the HAL train, as it's called, um, to really find out what the justifications were for building it. And uh, particularly in a country like South Africa, which has got some very interesting socioeconomic conditions. Um, now, that's talking about the legacy of apartheid it still very much shapes african society mm. as african society rather today um so they were touting the benefits um from a transport perspective so the the motorway the n1 the n1 very confusingly um between johannesburg and pretoria which goes past the airport is horribly congested and one of the things they wanted to try and do is reduce that congestion so they thought we can try and remove some of that traffic by building a parallel railway line and then we'll get some transit orientated development in settlements along the way so there's a, a settlement for example in the middle called midrand and that's where <laughs> that's where their office is uh well, the, the best thing about their office is that the, the doors to open the in like between the bits of the office they look like the electrostar doors for me that was really cool um that's nice and, yeah and um but there's nothing else really there uh, so more of my friends are off on safari pre-wedding and i was interviewing the good folks of the cow train about their <laughs> about their railway in the middle of nowhere um so the it connects the airport connects the cbds the central business districts of johannesburg and pretoria um and the, the the train is pretty pricey you know it's like um it's like 10 15 20 pounds a ticket in in you know british pounds mm. and this is south africa where you know, generally it's a pretty cheap place to be if you're traveling in from the West um, and wages are particularly high. So I start asking the questions about, you know, how much uh, modal shift are you realistically trying to get? What kind of markets are you trying to aim this railway at? You know, how much socioeconomic benefit is there going to come from it? How environmentally beneficial is this? Because they said, well, we're not producing any emissions because it's an electric railway. But the problem is, is that obviously 
they can claim that. And the Hao Teng, which is the regional government, they can claim that because the power to power the line comes from a bunch of coal powered fire, sta- fire yep. uh, power stations, which are in the neighboring province. So they can be like, oh, we're carbon neutral, but then not for the people who are living in the yep. next province along, yep. um, which is, I think, KwaZulu Natal. So that's kind of questioning these things. But also, what, what South African society kind of brilliantly highlights is that these disparities kind of solidify the existing paradigm, which is that those essentially who had money still have a lot of the economic wealth and power Mm. and everyone else kind of doesn't even though uh, since apartheid in many respects african society is one of the most egalitarian there is and what i mean by this is for example is that when or asking about how the how train was targeted at people um i asked at what groups they were targeting at and you can't delineate people in south african society by race or ethnicity or anything like that because of that history mm. so they have to do it like well, we, we have like eight income bands and that's how we class them and then you can see how many people sit in the bands and stuff but they don't collect ethnic data or anything like that which people folks in the west is a bit like but hang on how do you know where people are going what's going on but yeah but, yeah but it's so it's just a different paradigm um so so the how train is great if you're visiting it's great if you're traveling up and if you've got a you know from a middle class or, or well-to-do background um but i really challenged them on what it meant for people in places like for example the biggest township people might know of where a lot of the protests were in the 90s or in the 80s was soweto mm, um, yep, and yep. they said well we've got the plan for a new line and stuff and i was like but is it going to be like the same one that's going to be quite pricey and stuff and they were like uh, maybe so it was a very mm. um interesting problem to uh, to be looking at and actually if you go on to the next picture i'll tell everyone why yes so gareth you want to you want to uh, i'm going to audio describe what i can me. see so what i can see here uh, actually i'm going to skip back to the previous image just to point out you, you're about to make a very serious uh, uh point but i, I just want to describe how much this uh, the how train has like a renault espace aesthetic going on um <laughs> so uh yeah so skipping back to the next picture many many vehicles uh, all parked up is it uh is it a mark is this a market uh it's uh and it's kind clearly of. it's clearly in one of the uh kind of one of the majority black communities because there's a yeah so which i'm assuming as well uh looking at this sort of arrangement here it's probably one of the lower income uh band uh communities as well uh, yes so lots and lots of cars parked up lots of uh, some taxis parked up on one side mm. i think lots of kind of vans parked up in the middle here and lots of uh kind of little uh tents little kind of gazebo set up with bits and pieces people underneath um yeah so tell tell me what's actually going on here so i've just kind of visually described it and, and i have to say there's vehicles stretching off in this image is is sort of stretching off in all directions quite mm. a size so it's quite a major sort of size <clears throat> area here excuse me um yes so i'd love to actually say that this is in south africa unfortunately this isn't um and i'm saying that because there's a number of plates available so those that are able to spy oh. on the number plates and i'm sure they'll be eagle-eyed and people that will either w- watching live or later will pop, pop out and actually that's somewhere else um but the the point still stands is that in some african countries this particular picture is, is from Accra in ghana <clears throat> excuse me where i've also been um, this is their kind of informal bus system in in Accra. It's called a trotro, and in uh, South Africa, like in Johannesburg, it's called a combi. And what happens is is that these minivans will ferry people. Um, let's just say that their seating limits are, um, you know, kind of ignored, um, yeah. and people will pay like a, a fee to the essentially a conductor type character, and the mm. driver drives around. They do pretty much set routes the way that it was done in in uh acras they'd shout what route they were doing or their gesture so if it was going to the circle they'd draw a circle if it was going straight into town they'd do that um i think it's a similar kind of system in johannesburg unfortunately whilst in Accra it was safe enough for white people to do that it wasn't really safe enough to do this on my own or uh in in johannesburg that's just the kind of the way it goes um but these types of unofficial bus systems are a major way that people particularly from townships so we're talking out of the eight economic bands probably like one to three or four mm. um these folks are using these combi buses to get around and often again because of the way that johannesburg is massively spread out and that was part of the colonial uh, layout of the city which was partly defensive partly to do with mining um what happened was was that people were 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 kind of spread all over and then with apartheid they obviously wanted to keep white people in the city center where all the good stuff was and move all the black people out to townships 
and the railway lines, unfortunately, are part of the problem. The existing railway lines are part yeah. of the problem with that because they basically built the lines to do that. So, and obviously, it being fixed infrastructure is very difficult to change. So, when you get people starting to travel around to do jobs, um, you know, different types of service labor or whatever, um, people have to travel long distances, and and then you get this horrific stat which is that people from these types of communities, it's, it's not just in Africa, I know this is the same case in uh, cities like Bogota in Colombia as well, is that low-income folks who don't earn very much will spend up to 70%, that's 70% of mm. their income on travel, on these types of informal journeys to get to work. So they spend this money and then they whatever they keep is left to sustain and feed the family and pay extreme the extreme transport the driven pro- it's transport poverty it's uh, it's mm. yeah it's it's shocking exactly and given and then that's the, and that's the, what i mean by the socioeconomic side right so so this is how people are, are struggling to live i i would i would think quite not unfairly describe and then we can if we kind of pull back from the socioeconomic aspects we can say well also we have huge massive parts of the population moving around in these very badly kept diesel vans which are all lot of some of them are cast offs from europe and yeah, the emissions yeah. are dreadful and you know if you blow your nose after a day out in the city in johannesburg it will be black because of all the pollution um it's pretty horrid so and as is the same in the west in Europe and stuff, you know, the these types of pollution and socioeconomic problems disproportionately impact on p- people from poorer populations and poorer areas than it does on people who um, who are not from those areas who live a bit further out. Um, so I was going to say why, it does map yeah. onto European cities, like um, you know, mm. Western European capitals, London, uh, particularly in the UK, but also you know, um, Paris. Actually, essentially, any major city you, where, where, that has a, a reasonably decent sort of, eth- you know, pretty diverse city, you will find that public transport, the shape of public transport, is pretty prejudicial. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's pretty discriminatory uh, and very much entrenches existing, uh, you know, existing sort of, uh, basically the the problems, the poverty or the or, the, or people who are less well off that that gets entrenched by the shape of public transport systems. Yeah. Yeah. And let's not forget, I'll just add what it what pops, pops dates in my head, um, that we should also mention, um, particularly given the week we're in, that this also disp- massively, even more disproportionately uh, impacts on women. Um, it impacts on those from such like LGBTQ plus communities where, of course, in, in countries like South Africa, where it's, it's, it's extremely dangerous to be yeah. a member of one of those communities just to be who you are. Um, so, you know, we have obviously we raise awareness of these issues and there are things that we need to sort out in our own society. But, you know, remember that in other countries as well, the struggles are, are the, the similar, but also many fold and and very difficult to navigate um you know sexual violence in in south africa is a huge huge problem and these types of transport systems are part of that yeah yeah um so so and again this builds into the fact that we that that building better more sustainable transport systems are about tackling these inequalities it's Mm. about accessibility from a you know, in terms of people's uh, any of their respectable, uh, respective uh, kind of protected characteristics, um, you know, yeah. disability as well is, is, is yeah. something like these, these, these systems are, if you've got a disability and need to rely on these systems to move around, I think you're probably uh, kind of hard yeah. out of luck. Um, yeah, exactly. So let's move on to the next image. Mm. So, a, yeah, a bit of a contrast. So, so on screen, we've got... Um, yeah, I mean it's a pretty pretty open looking plaza. Uh, it's not very nice. Lots and lots and lots of bicycles parked up with some some nice ceilings. It look, looks a bit like a transport interchange uh, in a square. But tell us about tell us about tell us a bit more about what's on screen and tell us tell us more. It is so again the eagle eyed among you with all the bikes might have worked out which country we've popped back to. And <laughs> uh, yes, it is in fact um, it's very much Copenhagen. In fact, this picture. Um, is very close to just a short walk away from the uh, the bridge that we had on on the screen before. Mm. Um, so many of these people could have been cycling in. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, past this place. Uh, this place is called Nurport, which means Northern Gate. Um, so this wide boulevard that you're kind of looking past you down was actually where the city walls used to be. Um, and basically, 
what happened was on one side you had the old walled city of Copenhagen, which stayed very much within the medieval lines until wars kind of stopped being a thing, major concern for, for Denmark and Copenhagen, which was fairly late because Denmark and Sweden were at war with each other for a very long time. I think they have the record of being the country with at most long time at war against another country in the world. It was like 300 plus years or something ridiculous. So the Danes and Swedes really you know, don't like each other, and that's why they kick 10 bells out of each other during the football, which is always quite fun to watch. Um, so um, this was the city wall. It was a, obviously a huge, wide, massive wall with a ditch, and, and there was a, a literally a big old gate um, and and this was where the the gate was. Um, when the railways were expanding in Copenhagen, in kind of the late nineteenth, early twentieth century, they wanted to extend the the main line from the central station, which is to the western side of the city centre, um, towards the north. Um, obviously, having to go around the city walls, which just so happened the city walls were being dismantled at this point anyway. Um, so they mm. basically dug a trench under where the city walls were, a bit like the old Metropolitan Railway, slapped four tracks down in the big old trench and kind of covered it over again. <laughs> Um, so this area here at Nurport Station, now that the metro runs through here, which was finished in 2007-ish, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is now the busiest transport interchange in Scandinavia. I think it's 250,000 people a day, which when Copenhagen's population is about five, six hundred thousand, shows you that's that's a busy. massive interchange. Yeah, Black Peach Peach. Uh, of the off of the YouTube's uh, points out that um, that it is it doesn't look like much but it is also not only an interchange but it's the most used station in Denmark as well this one yes absolutely exactly and that's incredible given that it's a four platform station um, on the S train network which is akin to the S bahn um, like a regional train with little red train cute trains that look like caterpillars um, and then you have the two tracks for the mainline trains um, which uh, every year twice a year the, the Danish state railway DSB would run a little steam engine around the kind of uh, around literally a loop around the city using some old goods links which they've kept going um, and so being on the open top wagon at the front behind the engine oh my goodness these tunnels is excellent fun and there are, i think i posted some videos on it on twitter um you can find on my hashtag corona alone oh uh, yeah I've been, i have been following wear goggles everyone uh yes. yeah I've been yeah following. exactly <laughs> certainly i um but the point of this is that is that um is going a wrong way around to get to the point which is um this is kind of what your integrated transport hub looks like um there's there's bikes there is there are shops there's a wide boulevard what's what you can't see um, are the railway tracks which are beneath the photographer's feet um, as I said they're kind of dug, up, dug in that cut and cover you can't see the metro which is built beneath that as well um, and the bus stops which are dotted all around this area as well so in this area you can pretty much get anywhere and by anywhere I do mean anywhere you can get to Sweden from here um, so uh, so my friends in Denmark are actually from a town called Holbeck um, and one of them was trying to get the train back very drunk from Copenhagen so be very careful with your destinations because the trains run all night everywhere <laughs> yeah. like they, they drop down to one an hour and my friend gets on the train um he's called aspian he gets on the train and he just sees h and he thinks ah oh, that's the train home uh he woke up in sweden folks oh dear yeah yeah waking up in malmo uh not not oh he uh... was further than malmo <laughs> oh, oh goodness <laughs> It goes quite far into Sweden if you get the, the, the right or wrong train, depending on which way you look at it. So it really is a massive hub, and it gets the airport. You can either get the National Rail or the um, Metro. Um, so it really is a huge hub, and, and what we need are these transport nodes. We need these integrated hubs, and ideally we'd have this mix, like you kind of see here, of active travel and public transport. Um, and that's really is a way of not only doing it in a way that is sustainable in terms of, well, if you walk or bike or take the train, it's low carbon. It also makes transport more accessible. It opens up connectivity. And that has those socioeconomic benefits, which, which I'm going to keep saying, which should not be forgotten about when we talk about sustainability. Because if we don't include that term, and I can't stress this enough, then sustainability as a word, as a concept, in my opinion, in my opinionated opinion, does lose its meaning. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think one of the things that I feel kind of reasonably uh, poorly equipped to kind of tackle on this is it's quite a contrast moving from um, uh, somewhere that perhaps people would describe as a, an image from the third world, uh, but certainly, you know, an area where the, 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 the average income is orders of magnitude lower to a, to a very shiny looking public plaza in, a, in, in northern Europe. There is there is a kind of a stark contrast, and, and and given that Northern Europe can afford to pay for these plazas largely by exploiting the people who are in the previous image in uh, decades and centuries gone by, um, yeah, there's there's a lot there's a lot to unpick there. 
and the least we can do is do our very best to think about that some of those con- some of those mm. historic injustices in the way that we develop public transport now and, yep. and even in the uk when you're thinking about you know new public transport projects new uh, planning for stations you've got to think about <clears> some <throat> of those communities who are being excluded from public transport now why are they being excluded what historic reasons are there for th- for them being excluded you know it might uh, it might look like geography um, and oh, but there isn't a railway nearby. Well, have a think about why that might be, and mm. uh, and then try your very best to unpick that. So so yeah, we've yeah. we've got to. And and if you don't do that, you're, you're, it's, the system is not sustainable. You're 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 essentially backing up existing injustices, which is not sustainable. It is not sustainable. Exactly. Um, anyway, I feel hopelessly ill-equipped to discuss that at, at, at particular length. Um, but future rail matters, we <clears> shall <throat> unpick it in uh, as as much as we can. Uh, but Simon, I think you've done an excellent job of, of explaining and sort of characterising oh. that that element of why, of, of what what all the different elements that build up the building blocks that form a sustainable transport system. But we're not done yet. Thank because you. Because there's this Sorry, picture we've rushed the pixels throat. a little Ugh. bit. That's all right. Tell so tell what what what's on screen now, Simon? Tell us tell us what you can see. Well, this is um this is this is is a nice little visual metaphor. Um, what we're looking at is a kind of a high angle, um, kind of zoomed in shot of the Medway Valley, where the M2 motorway, which was, well, oh, Gareth, you might know this more than me. I think sixties, seventies, they built the M2. So uh, like. The original. So, so the 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 middle. No, sorry, the uh, furthest right of these. Yes, mm. um, but the middle one was upgraded much more recently in the in the uh, yeah. in the nineties. Yes, yeah, so they built this. They built the M2 motorway from South East London towards um, towards Dover for kind of obvious reasons, because uh, you know apparently lots of people want to go to France. I, mean, I can imagine why. You know why do you want to be near you? Um, <laughs> and uh, sarcasm. Um, and <laughs> they um, expanded the motorway um, in that wonderful wisdom of, of course, if you if we have traffic, then um, you know build more lanes. This this makes sense, except that if you build more lanes, you just generate more traffic induced demand everyone um which i'm sure most of you will know know anyway um but then along in the 2000s they started building this lovely little high speed line called high speed one uh which I'm, i hope all of you have ridden on if you haven't uh, next time you can come pop on a eurostar from uh from uh, lille or brussels or paris and fly along at 186 miles an hour it's lovely um so here you've got three bridges of, over the medway of the high speed one and the two large uh, multi-laid bridges of the M2, and I think it's a nice visual metaphor for showing how the impact of building a railway line, which probably has, well, given this, I've even just noticed there's a, there's a Eurostar, which looks tiny in there, which is 700 plus capacity, I think. Yeah, I was going to say. So all of the cars, this this is the motorway looking, in fairness, pretty empty, mm. but all of the cars that you can see, I was counting this just while you were chatting there, all the cars you can see in shot have about the capacity of a third of the train that's currently in shot. Uh, possibly yeah. less, actually. It's around about that. But, it, mm. it, you know, counting, you know, it's, it, given that one coach carries about 50 vehicles worth, if not more, um, it doesn't take long before you start counting and realise that all of the cars in shot is only about 100 vehicles, if that, within sh- in, in this pretty high-up aerial shot, covering probably the best part of two miles of road. Uh, there are not many cars there. No. And um, yeah, and, and even if that wrote that that motor, if at the M2 at, at maximum capacity there, so you've got um, uh, what is it, a four lane uh, on the uh, kind of heading south and uh, or well, it's not south there, is it's it's east, southeast, uh, and you've got uh, three lanes going the other direction. The capacity of that road is still probably only around uh, a third of the capacity of the railway, despite how yeah. much more land it takes up. Yeah, exactly. So a nice visual metaphor for showing how we can carry, we can convey lots of freight um, and lots of people uh, quickly, efficiently. Um, you know, once we people then will say, um, oh, but the electricity is generated by um, by horrible means. Um, we have a government which, albeit extremely slowly and reluctantly, is decarbonising our electricity grid. Um, if you have, I think it's my GB energy or something as a Twitter handle type my GB, it should pop up, which I follow. I highly recommend it shows regular updates of our energy mix. Yes. So like what percentage is nuclear, 
uh, solar, biomass, coal, which is usually zero. There's a little bit of coal fired up at the moment because of the extra electricity usage, whatever. Um, but generally speaking, we're going to shift away from the biggest problem, which is gas at the moment. Um, yep. So we, we, we turned off the majority of our coal burning power stations and either convert them to biomass or just turn them off and start using gas instead, which is a bit like... Um, it's a bit like switching a, a, a diesel to a petrol car. It's still lots of problems. It's pretty much um, exactly the same amount of rubbish gets spat out the top. It's a, a great success yeah. of the of the of the um, petrochemical industry to have convinced society somehow that gas is cleaner than coal, Ugh. when it, it basically isn't. <laughs> so to all intents I, and purposes, it's just as bad. Joe, you know, Joe, you know question time, Gareth. I stopped watching it a long, long time ago. But I don't know if you if you watch it, anyone from the UK or the watchers BBC might have seen this this show, Question Time. And I, one of the reasons I stopped watching the, the damn thing was because there was an energy minister, I think, no. who was from from was from a blue fa- flavor of government, shall I say, um, who was saying uh, was challenged on why they were removing subsidies for green energy and particularly for wind farms, and we and he said something like. Uh, of course, it was a he. So something. Like, well, we couldn't possibly subsidise the green sector, and it's like, but 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 you, you're already subsidising the fossil fuel sector. You you, you sponge. I mean, what are you? Uh, girl. Um, oh, no. Very irritating. Um, so, and one of the reasons why the big energy companies don't like renewable energy is because it makes electricity production cheaper, yeah. and that's why they don't Quite like substantially it. cheaper. Wind and solar are super cheap. And the only reason that nuclear, which would be the cheapest of them all, is so expensive is because government uh, creates ridiculously bizarre contracts in the way of delivering these things. Base bomb. Uh, don't. But that's that's another. When we get Lindsay uh, Broadwell yes. on to talk about electric bikes, I'm sure we'll yes. touch on nuclear. Yes, 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 yes. Because it'd be dash not to. Um, yes. So uh, I love this image. In fact, I love any image that has uh, high speed one, Britain's second high speed railway. Uh, and um, and the and the M2 in it because they're just it's just such a br- in fact Highways England put an image up advertising their own motorways with HS1 in it and I think the the comms person who did it sheepishly and gently humorously all to all to their credit um, point, kind of laughed at a bit of a whoops moment of, of them doing that but um, yeah I think these images they all, the images always show what what rail is is capable of um, in fact you can still see everything sort of healing a bit the land is healing mm. in this because i presume this is pretty sharpishly after the work yeah. was done Must all be the whole roads are still right? in place all the yeah. concrete's looking very shiny but yeah the mm. three medway viaducts pretty spectacular um spot actually if you're a civil engineering buff uh, mm. anyway right so ah uh, here we go the next image Oh, mm. is that all you wanted to say about that one, by the way? Just uh, was it a... Yeah, yeah, that was it. The only thing I wanted to, to, to add there, just because you mentioned it, is, Gareth, I think I think you should mention that um, for anyone who's in any doubt, what is Britain's high, first high-speed line, Gareth? Go oh, on. it's the Selby Good. Diversion, yeah. There you go. I, uh, yeah, and it, th- in fact, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I could put an image up, but I'm not going to, which is of the... In my desktop is three different images, all of the Selby Diversion. It's best not to um, worry about it's that. One, it's one got Colton Junction at there. Uh, yeah, I think, in fact, all three images are Colton Junction in various oh, oh, states of construction. Or... Totally makes sense. <laughs> they are in history. Oh, makes dear me. Yeah, lots of people in the chat agreeing with them. The fact, yeah, as Graham Harris points out, gas is still a hydrocarbon, so CO2 is still produced. Yeah, it's still pretty nasty. Um, so here is a nice looking, uh, well, it looks a bit like an N-gauge model, actually. Uh, of it does, what, isn't it? Actually, is this, you're not going to John Elledge me, are you? Is this is this a is this a real picture or a model? Uh, I've, I've just got, John Elledge has just cancelled me. Uh, he's not happy with the reference. But in any case, this, this looks awfully model-like. Uh, it, it's as far as I know, it is a real, a real image. Um, although it does look very modelly. Um, yeah, yeah. But does anyone know? Play a game with the chat. Um, anyone know where this is? Which station this is? See, for a variety of reasons, I know exactly where this is. I mean, partly you can actually read it in the image, but we won't tell anyone that. But Ooh. also, um, uh, hint, hint. It's yeah. There are Chris McKenna's on it. It's Leeds. Yes. Go, yeah. Well yes. done. Well done. Leeds. Oh, Sarah. So I beg your pardon. Uh, <coughs> Sarah got there first. Sarah Noble got there first. Leeds. 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 Perfect. Leeds. Oh, everyone's on Leeds. it. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. No, around that um this is it yeah so this is Leeds station and i think this is this this is um a kind of a night shot it's all very arty and the kind of photo i wish i could take where there's like a ridiculous kind of aperture thing going on where the the, the kind of the, the circle around there's like a, a circle of focus in the middle and then everything else is lovely <laughs> and blurred um and it looks like a modern train set so the reason i kind of put this in um, was to kind of round off this this thing this this side this topic of where we talk about how you know in the in the countryside areas 
ideally we want to um, enhance the urban or at least kind of concreted areas because there is an argument that if you live in a village that is urban because that's where buildings are and where people live um, and it's important that we manage not just those areas but also what goes on outside of them so I mean apart from industrial uses that we should be designated pockets of land to be as I said before, just let nature kind of do its thing. Mm. Uh, because if you leave nature alone, it will do its thing. And I really can't stress that enough. Um, but also managing our our railway capacity. Um, so Leeds are put in here for a couple of reasons. One is because it is a bonkersly kind of capacity bursting at the seams yes. station. Lots of people um, in the chat going, good grief, it's busy. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, I can't imagine what it's like now because I haven't, I, I can't remember the last time I left the south of, england yeah um, actually i was there recently getting my phone fixed and um uh, it is a little bit weird <coughs> bleak seeing it as empty as it is but even when it was empty you know there are still mm. streams of people pouring in and out yeah um, that's it so leeds has it's got this is, is this kind of great metaphor because it's this bonkers overcapacity station um there's the fact that there's any kind of doubt being sowed about hs2 reaching uh via an easter leg is also absolute bonkers and it's just we shouldn't be doing it, folks. We just why in Britain I despair as a planner as well. I, I just despair of the fact that if you one thing that you learn about Britain when it comes to planning, we don't plan. We yes, don't we plan. don't do it at all. No. We never plan because planning is bad. It's what it's what communists do. Ugh. Or the Europe the bloody mainland Europeaners. Yeah, those just, ruddy Europeans don't their do their welfare they do. state and their good infrastructure and cheap railway fares and oh god, Grr. isn't it terrible, Gareth? Um so yeah, so so uh, you know, it, it, we need more capacity into a station like Leeds. That isn't going to come from just trying to squeeze in platforms on bits of bridge and brick that are kind of peek, peeking out. That's kind of what's happening with Leeds is squeezing out platform zero. I believe at the bottom of this picture somewhere there's going to be this zero is going to be kind of shoved in somewhere. Um, and um, also Leeds has the ignominy of being the largest city in Western Europe um, without a proper public transit mass transit system. Um, and you know buses are great but they don't cut it really you need a proper metro you need a proper tram um, and I'll make a comparison with a, a country I know very well which is France if a city like Grenoble in France this tiny city can have three tram lines yeah yeah then I think that Leeds which I think has a population which is probably more than a lot of major French cities can have a tram line at the very least or some kind of metro and this leads us a perfect example of a city that needs to boost rail capacity needs to move beyond buses and, and put in some kind of proper tra public transit system and also provide um active infrastructure because all these things that are done linked up based on where people go where the economic activity is we can generate journeys and transfer journeys through modal shift etc to sustainable modes whilst providing the economic output and the so social benefits that are so necessary. It doesn't mean that we have to, but everyone working from home, it doesn't mean we have to do things where we are cutting back on travel necessarily. It, it can, it can be about how you travel. And for me, the dream is, is that, you know, I could live in Leeds, get on a bike, cycle to a tram stop, get on the tram to the, or the Metro to the, the station, pop on a high speed two, pop on a Eurostar, and, you know, I've got to the other side of Europe uh, for, a, for a little city break. And my carbon footprint has been like nothing, basically, you know, as it, and, and that's the dream. And the, and, and, and the sad thing is, is that that is all perfectly possible. But we just need to have the willpower, which is why that, that gets back to my sustainable kind of advocate nut uh, hat on, which is where I'm going to uh, be very obnoxious and shout this from the rooftops on, on Twitter and otherwise uh, and bother people uh, who make decisions where I can about these are the things that we need to do and we need to think beyond the next control period we need to think beyond the next electoral cycle we need to think beyond and think forward so that we actually have a grasp of what sustainability really is we could build sustainability into everything we do if we want to and can actually plan for it absolutely it's really important that you touch on um, the need for us to think about, uh, you, you know, to avoid the idea of th that reducing. I mean, there are a couple of things at play, of course. In the UK, 88, well, you know, 88 to 90 percent of people and things move around by road. So we need to massively expand the capacity of our public transport systems or of our sustainable transport systems. So there's a huge way to go. So ignore COVID, 
because we still have so much uh, extra requirement for capacity in our public transport systems, particularly for freight as well with so many HGVs on the road. Secondly, the idea that you can reduce the amount people travel around without it being regressive, well, there are there are a few policy things that you can do that help. But by and large, whenever I quiz uh, a certain colour of party on what they're going to do to reduce the amount people move around uh, at scale, you know, OK, around the edges, fine. But in terms of at scale, reducing the amount people move around pretty solid chance that it's going to be hugely regressive and by what i mean what i mean by regressive for anyone who's not sure what that means is that it will impact people who are in lower income bands um who invariably are also uh people from ethnic you know people from a you know, who are not white uh also generally impacts on women as well mm. uh you're going to impact those people and actually the rich men from higher earning uh, backgrounds are just going to pay a bit more and still be able to do exactly what they want to do. So reducing the amount of people travel at scale is not socially acceptable as an approach to tackling climate change. We have the answers. We have the solutions to reduce our, our imp the impact of moving around to zero or close mm. to zero now. So why would we not choose to do those rather than impacting on people who are less well off? Simon, go for it. Can I add to that? Um, just what pops into my head mm. is if anyone have you read Caroline Carla Perez's book Invisible Women? I uh, have. I've, it's on my. Like, I've read bits of it. I've, it's on yeah. my. I've, I own it and have read chunks of it that felt relevant. But I need to go back and cover to cover it. It's um. It's, it's brilliant. A, everyone it, should it's get it. It's fantastic as it is irritating and frustrating to read. Uh, basically, it's it's this point that a lot of us don't see, particularly if you're a person who looks a bit like Gareth and I, kind of a white cis dude. Um, where a lot of the world is just simply not designed um, with women in mind at all. Not not because you know these could, are conscious decisions that well, we don't like women. Yeah. It's more a case of they're just not thought about. And a good example of this is uh, the one where she quotes that um, you know car seat design is yeah. safety crash testing is done through the average person in theory, but actually it's the average male. It's not even the average male, it's the average US male yeah. who's of, of a certain dimension, height and weight. So it means that in crashes, uh, automotive crashes, uh, women are 17% more likely to die and I think 70% more likely to get seriously injured mm. than men because of the way the seats are just not designed. And when you think about it, my mum, tiny Jewish lady, she sits like at the wheel when she drives the car. Like, and I'm concerned because if she bonks something and the, the airbag comes out it's going to be right enough it could probably do it more damage than than savor in some respects it's really worrying um how the world is designed like that and also it, it impacts on our transport systems because our transit networks and this is where the interplay between like fixed infrastructure like public transport and uh, active travel kind of comes into play mm. is that our fixed infrastructure is generally a radial um, which means that it's going from out to in or vice versa. And this really favours the kind of traditional commute, which is generally a kind of male thing to do because it was born out of the kind of pre and post war period. Um, and obviously women do it in a massive part of the workforce now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you read Caroline Carano Perez's book, you'll find that actually women do a lot of the kind of care work. They do trip chaining where they'll do like yeah. a, a shopping visit and then another thing, another thing, another thing. And they're often moving around the kind of the local area and they're often moving across the radial links. Yeah. And that's where active travel has to come in. And that's where public transport like bus networks really need to kind of step up their game to enable travel to be better. And the stupid thing that is really highlights this is the fact that I live in Tottenham and my parents live back in Harrow. It would, if I had a car right now, it would take me, you know, 25 minutes, half an hour to drive over to that part of Northwest London. If I was taking public transport, it would take, if I was lucky, 45 minutes, probably more like an hour, maybe more if there's a problem. Because you have to go into central London, right? You have to go, da -dunk. exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's a huge problem. And, and I think it's always always good to think about, um, you know, those that, that, that don't interact necessarily with the transport system as well. Um, and it goes back to that democratizing public space and providing the, the you know, democratizing transport by providing a good walking and cycling infrastructure. My borough in Haringey is rubbish at this, despite being having some of the poorest wards in the country. Um, they just don't get this idea that, you know, they think they think that people who bike are like kind of white dudes like me with a kind of office job kind of thing uh, whereas actually the biggest benefit for this would be for people who can't afford a car or can't afford to an oyster card because it's expensive yeah it's um it's uh, yeah it's it 
we have to think about yeah basically it's good to open our minds to what other people do it's why it's, i try my best to, to listen as hard as i can to other people's experiences um yeah no, it, it's uh so it is a very nice people are wanting people are shouting very loudly yes. um that uh a variety of things first this image is called it's called tilt shift everyone uh, i've got a filter on my camera that does it but i think it, it it's fake tilt shift not real tilt shift tilt shift um, that's cool uh yeah uh and what what other chat oh ella the developer points out if the overground didn't exist um that her uni commute would be over a hundred pounds a month more, uh, but slightly quicker because of um, stoppers. Yeah, the overground is one of the few examples where we have a, a kind of a rather than having a radio, we've got kind of a circumferential, <coughs> circumferential uh, system. There aren't many in the UK. Uh, and I remember what it was like before the overground existed when it was absolutely rubbish. It was grubby old three one threes going three an hour on Silverling, the. Uh, right? That's the ones. Yeah, they were they were they were terrible, and I. I uh, when I was in year seven, which for international folks is when I was the first year of secondary school slash high school, and I was about 11 years old, um, I was on one of these Silverlink trains leaving Camden Road, and there were young kids smoking crack cocaine. Um, so it's it's a world away uh, now um, to what it to what it is, and it's always had that potential. You know, if you invest in transport, it can make a huge difference, um, and get away from the kind of the the awful kind of stuff that used to go on and then you have like america when i was in new york a few years ago um it was unbelievable looking at the subway i was just like this is like the tube in 1994 it's dirty it's grubby everything's broken it smells yeah, yeah even 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 i have not been taking the tube for long because i was only a visitor to, i only went to london like um in the, the end of like sixth form uh, which mm-hmm. is like the end of high school so I so but even then, like the the tube looks tidier now than it did. Although although we've gone full circle, that like Britain's looking grubbier again, like it was in the mid nineties, because we've yeah. had you know years of of the the state being stripped back uh, in a rather Thatcherine style. Uh, in any case, um, oh God, we've got Thatcher. The Crown is just I've been watching it because I was I was the the best Crown episode. We're going to diverge into talking about the Crown for five seconds. The best okay. Crown episodes are the ones that are about society. <laughs> Um, the ones that, like I don't particularly care about these um, inbred rich people, um, but uh, oh dear, anti-Semitic, cast... anti-Semitic ones as well. Uh, yeah, well, um, but I do find that like the ones where they actually briefly mention real society um, are always quite interesting, and I because I quite like period stuff. I quite like recent period stuff because recreating the early eighties is something you don't often see in camera because it's a it's it's a bit awkward. But mm. um, anyway, so. Uh, yeah, I can't remember what my point was, but stuff looks really stuff looks really grubby in some of the episodes, mm. and I was loving it. Although I also like to pick holes in the in their whenever public transport does appear, I like to pick holes in it because you know. Oh, what, me too. It's what all the nerds do when we watch stuff on telly, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. In any case, let's uh, let's go small faces again because yeah, I think we're coming close to the end, and we're we're we are we've been streaming for an hour and twenty three minutes. We're twenty three minutes late. Sorry, everyone. Oh. Um, yes. So. Um, oh, actually, we've got some questions. So let, let, let's go back oh, yeah, to side questions. by side. Oh, right. Actually, because there's some, there's lots of my, fa- lots of my name appearing and, and in the chat. So, um, uh, David Shepard asks, uh, how do you have more bikes in the UK without them getting stolen? Uh, it's a very good point. But actually, as more people own bikes, there'll be more imperative and understanding, and and the police will get better at it, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, just, just, uh, just add into that, which is that. Obviously, Denmark, Danish Copenhagen society, part of the reason why it's such a nice place to live is because it's a very pleasant, safe kind of place in like 95, 99 percent of the time. The biggest theft that happens like every day constantly is bike theft. Mm. I mean, professional bike theft. If they see your bike, it will be gone. Um, So I quite like that in a sense. I think it's a very good descriptor. What I mean is, it's a very good descriptor of a society. If the most prevalent crime is bike theft, which at <laughs> the end of the day is like just really annoying, and and they are creative. I remember so so th- some friends of mine went to a jazz festival in the summer. We parked our bikes. He had the nice shiny racing bike. His was parked the fence. Then like four other bikes of our friends group was parked there. The thieves wanted it. They took our bikes, unlocked them all took the one they wanted, put the rest back, and locked them. <laughs> so it was like, wow, that's inconvenient, and thanks. Yeah, and, and thank you, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, it was, it was really weird. So, so bike theft is, is a huge problem. Um, you have to lock your bike up sensibly. Uh, the little tricks of the trade are to always lock your bike to a thing that's designed to be have a bike locked uh, to it. 
Um, Jeremy, make sure it's in some kind of lit area. And the really sneaky thing I do, I shouldn't be telling you this, but I'm going to anyway. Um, that is always park your bike next to one that looks shinier than yours and don't get it cleaned. And also use a D-lock, for goodness sake. Yeah, um, yeah use string, God. Uh, so, uh, John Christoph, uh, hello to... Uh, to the to North America. Congratulations on binning the the moron. Um, how do we shift understanding amongst uh, among institution leadership types who conceptualise sustainability solely in financial terms? I.e., can we afford to keep spending money on X project? That is an excellent question. Um, I, Where do we start? Abolish well, the treasury in the UK. Abolish the yes. treasury is not a bad start. Um, well, yes. When you have a country run by people who, as was said before, that know the price of everything and the value of nothing, that's a very good point. Um, in the Department for Transport, I think I get the sense that there is a un beginnings of an understanding that we need to um, we need to be able to start factoring in the price of not dealing with climate change. Yeah. Because no matter how much it costs now to build an HS2 or a new metro or Crossrail to what? Uh, well, Crossrail for the North, whatever. Yeah, let's, let's not be London centric. I know I'm sitting in London right now. Um, then, you know. We need to um, we need to factor in that wider that wider picture. Green book reform, the green the Treasury Green Book. They've been talking about reform for such a long time, and uh, and it still has not happened in any meaningful way. So no, accounting for account, I mean the rules exist now, exist now to account for carbon. They exist now. They're just never used. The modelling is is inadequate. Um, the other thing, so that, that, yeah. You, John Christoph points out a thing which is really important, which is unfortunately across Britain, people right across the political spectrum have got the the household the household finances analogy deeply ingrained in their mind that that national finances are like household finances and you've got to balance the books, which just isn't how money works. It's oh. not how money works. There's lots of interesting things done. Pick at some point, maybe maybe like Rail Natter four hundred, we'll get to the point where we can have like Mariana Mazzucato on talking about. Um, uh, mission-oriented economics and, 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 oh, and that sort of easy. thing. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. So, uh, no, good good question, John. A very tricky one to resolve. David Shepard is moaning about uh, London Overground BMPA systems telling pastors not to give money to homeless people. That's rubbish, yes. Um, Sarah Noble is pointing out the Aberfan episode uh, got a bunch of accolades. It did. It was a good episode, actually. Uh, did not paint royalty in particularly good light. Um, what else? Other, other questions. Chris Jackson, how do we monetize the value of sustainability to emphasize the cost of not doing it? Well, we've got some of the ability to do that now with, um, you know, with carbon, co you know, with financial, uh, mm. you know, pounds associated with tons of carbon. But that's a we need to be better at understanding some of the um, some of the behind the scenes costs, some of the internalized costs that we forget mm. about, that we ignore. The road pricing episode was good about that, actually, mm. that we had. Um, Edward Leon talking about all the costs that we just forget about when we when we drive a car when we when we run a car. Um, yes, that whole that whole mindset's all skewy, and and the other thing is that you know, how, how, what what price can we put on the fact that you know forget COVID, forget Brexit, even forget the last economic recession, we cannot price climate change highly enough because you know if just from a British perspective, if climate change goes on kind of unchallenged. You know, most of our coastline will be underwater. A lot of London will be underwater, and then you know, not exactly sustainable. Yeah, we're um for people who don't realise. I, I remember when I was when I was a kid, there were lots of maps, pull out maps from like newspapers showing like like gently tongue in cheek showing what Britain would look like if we were on a trajectory for two degrees of warming. Um, Score. we're on we're on a steeper trajectory than that at this point, everyone. Like people, uh, there are occasional people who tell me to just ah oh, tone it down with the climate stuff. You know, if you if you're too dramatic, people just don't buy into it. Um, yeah, no, because there is so much more anger to to, to the, given that we are currently on the trajectory where most of uh, Lower England disappears, uh, East Anglia ceases to exist, London becomes a puddle. Like this is the trajectory we are currently on. By the end of the century, lots of yeah. bits of England will not exist. Lots of bits of the central belt of Scotland will not exist. Like yeah. this is not. And if that's happening, in given that that's happening uh, in Northern Europe within the next sort of few decades, it's already happening. Pacific Islanders that that have their they're basically are having their their home territories will not exist. Uh, it's already happening now, where the Pacific Islands that are basically becoming uninhabitable. Um, the Indian subcontinent, Bangladesh particularly, huge areas that that are already underwater for more of the year than they ever have been before. 
It's happening now. If you're not noticing the impacts of climate change, it's because of your privilege, not because they're not happening. Everyone and everyone on this chat knows that. I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here, but we we need to assert that fact with people who aren't perhaps as com confident about um yes. about it. Um, let's keep going with questions because I've mm. run behind. This, this is great. I haven't done a questions thing for ages. Um, right. Uh, da, 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 where was I? Uh, bus services are very poor in in Kidderminster. Okay, town not huge, but people who don't use cars are in trouble in the area. Has a big hill. Oh, I'm not quite. I must have missed something. Uh, something about Amtrak Joe. Thanks, Graham Harris, for pointing that out. Yes, good old Amtrak Joe. Although, um, slightly dubious relationship with the reality of climate change, frankly, but better than uh, Trump. Yeah. Um, uh, duh, 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 where are we? Uh, John Christoph, the example I had in mind was NASA human spaceflight and the outgoing administration. But yeah, same thing applies there. It's interesting you talk about NASA because um, uh, that's sort of Mariana Mazzucato's example, the Apollo uh, program, which is probably the greatest human project uh, that's ever been worked on, uh, is is an example of good mission oriented uh, economics uh, where we mm. where we can achieve quite a lot if we just focus on a an existential challenge or a target hmm, climate change feels like one of those uh, how do we get sustainable <laughs> transport into low population areas says david shepherd the government wants to do big places first well frankly you do want to do the big places first because the other stuff trickles down I, people often say yeah but what about me i've got a 35 mile commute from from uh, you know from annick to 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 carlisle it's like well that is not the key issue. That the, the 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 emissions represented by those fringe examples are minuscule. It's the big bulk stuff. It's the A50 yeah. in east in the East Midlands that is like toe to tail, uh, nose to tail traffic for three hours a day, four hours a day, mm. just pumping junk out into the atmosphere. So it's right. those corridors that need the work, not the um, not the fringe examples. Mm. Romy Adkrat, uh, sea level. If, if sea levels rise, uh, the people will just sell their homes before they're flooded and buy homes in higher areas. Smiley face, you're being cheeky, uh, Romy Adkrat. Oh, uh, you're referencing you're referencing the Ben Shapiro uh, H bomber guy on 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 Twitter destroyed him when he was saying uh, Ben Shapiro did his talk of well, well let, let, let's say the sea levels rise. Uh, all watch the clip. I highly recommend. Uh, all watch the the sea levels rise, um, and what, those people who are under threat will just sell their homes and move somewhere higher ground. And the H one guy comes, axes through the wall, and goes, "Who are they going to sell their houses to? Ben Aquaman?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh golly, amazing. Um, it's absolutely sensational. Right. So uh, there we go. Lots of lots lots of great chat there. Lots of great comments. Hopefully, I've kept it broadly on top of. Uh, Oh, it's Green Steve points out that the Thames Barrier is closing tomorrow because of a flood alert. Yes. Well, there you go. Oh, That's Sarah Noble has quoted the... Yeah, there we go. Selling to what, Ben? Fucking Aquaman? There we That's go. That's the one. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know we could swear. Oh, I should, I should have beat myself out. Well, we're not... But I, I try and avoid it, but, you know, sometimes it's, it's necessary. Uh, at some point, I'll work out how to put a sand pad in and, and I'll, put, uh, I'll, put, I'll, I'll be able to just bleat myself. There we go. Oh, uh, it, it has to be train horns, though, Gareth. It has to be yes, that's a good point. I need to get a two-tone in. So when I, when, I do a, when I do a swear, it's a two-tone. Yeah. Right. Uh, let's go back to the small faces where we've got this nice image again where we're going to yeah. close out. So tell us about this image. Good grief. It's okay. It's, it's one hour 33. I think this was your close out image anyway, right? This is the one. Yeah, this is this is the final one. Um, this is just a nice little bit of, of uh, well, I, part, I partly put this in just to please Gareth, really. It's got a lovely bit of P-way in it. A um, pleasant just... set of pair, pair of trailing and facing crossovers there. Yeah, exactly. Although the, the, the six foot, the, 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 the interval between them looks a little bit dicky. Odd. Yeah, it's a, bit, it's a weird kink a bit further up. Anyway, anyway, we're being we're being <laughs> I, um, I don't know exactly know where this is. In fact, it, can we crowdsource on the chat to find out where this is because my instinct kind of tells me it's a little bit German, but it's not. Um, and and kind of the people in the chat might actually work out where this is. Um, but either way, I, I like the green signal in the in the in the six foot there, which is kind of a a good metaphor of this long straight piece of electrified railway. That um, number one, um, you know, the green signal is there if you want to see it for um, the sustainable kind of evolution that we need to to uh, be the path that we need to be on. Um, there is a straight route there. We just need to get on with it and to do it mm. and stop worrying about things like BCRs, benefit cost ratios and value for money. And anyone who anyone who kind of talks about, oh, well, how much it costs, just just tell them, no, it, it's it's an investment in not, you know, flooding, um, et cetera. And yeah, we, we just need to we just need to focus on doing what we do but doing it in a sustainable way which means that we can carry on with our quality of life i mean we can't stress that enough it, it is important you know there's a reason why in danish they have this word called hygge, um which loosely translates as kind of like comfortable nice 
uh, feeling that they they do. Uh, it's a very versatile word. So it's like a noun, adverb, and and um, and verb as well. So you know, to, to who goes to have a nice time, uh, like at Christmas with family, or just on a beach in the sun, um, and to, to to have a quality of life, to have a moment to yourself, and that's important, folks. Mental health is difficult to 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 live with and and especially in these in these crazy times these things are important to the human experience don't let people tell you particularly for economic reasons do not let people tell you that these things aren't important because they absolutely are um and it means we can do things like gareth and i i know that um you know we haven't actually had a chance to do like a meet up because we can't travel but at some point We'll go off and travel around. We'll go here. We'll, we'll do our own thing. I, I haven't been to Scotland this year, which is again another travesty of this. Of this, another victim of the plague has been that my annual Scottish jaunt that I always like to do is gone. But we should be able to do these things. We can do it in a carbon, a low carbon way. We can do it in a way that's beneficial to society. Um, there is a path to a, a good place, and the whole point of sustainability is the fact that if we all work towards that common goal, doing all the things that we do, and I particularly mean this with my YRP hat on, to inspire, promote and develop the next generation of railway talent, we have the people out there who can come onto the railway, get into the transport sector, get into the energy sectors, take these jobs and learn these skills and really get the message out there for the next generation. Because in a, in a sense, kind of for Gareth and I, our parents' generation haven't, haven't done the bits. And we're trying that we've got the new generation come in, do the bits for us, get the message out there, you know, swing politicians' mindsets towards where those votes come from. And we will make a difference towards making uh, our lives, both from an environmental perspective or from, from a socioeconomic perspective, more sustainable. And we'll be walking, biking and uh, and taking the train around you know, in a way that means society can go on and we're not on fire slash and or underwater. Not being on fire and or underwater is a very positive thing for us to, to focus on, I think. That's, it's always good. Yeah, Simon, I, I just, nothing more I have to add, really. It's that. I'm just going to cheer about that. Other than perhaps to say that the, 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 the chat, the, the real natterers are brilliant. And they've just come up with, no. the, 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 these are West German signals. Uh, so it's definitely yes. Germany or Austria. Uh, okay. And good. other information. And yeah, you can see the route's been set, actually. So that the, the route's there set for crossing over from... Oh yeah. Oh, wait, no, it won't, because it's the other round. So actually, it's, the route is set for the facing crossover, uh, or is it no? Because it's green. Oh, I'm confused. So the trains are actually travelling in the same direction that, or is it by by die signal? Who knows? Anyway, I'm not okay. a signaler, but it looks a bit like the uh, the trains normally travel in the same way they do in the UK. So I don't know. Does that help where this is? I don't know. I remain confused. Uh, I was thinking Germany, but then I thought that, that Germans that they because I nerd out on this kind of stuff. That the German um, kind of catenary cantilever portals usually have this kind of green kind of look to them, um, which is quite unique looking. This kind of lattice kind of structure. Whereas in Denmark, for example, they have this like kind of weathered steel, this rust, rusty looking. Yeah, stuff. people have called us out for not using, not referencing the core ten steel uh, OLE. Actually, I can't remember who it was. Um, someone in the chat has told me off for not not okay. putting a squeezing a picture of that OLE in actually. So uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Um, thanks everyone for listening. Who those who did in podcast form? It's another long one, one hour thirty eight. Oh my goodness me, yeah, it's, it's a beast happen. of a rail matter. I thought we were doing pretty well, but it it it, it, it collapsed yeah, at the end. <laughs> I, I, this is it. I always like doing. I like to catch up with questions in the chat, and it always extends time. Uh, for the people who get angry about that and think that I flip around and these are too long. That's the format, Soz, folks. Soz. Um, if you want to make a compressed version, then you can uh, download it by sticking PP after the word YouTube in the URL, make a crop version, send it, send me a Dropbox link, and then I'll create a new a new uh, playlist with compressed rail natters. But in the meantime, uh, I'm not doing that because otherwise they just wouldn't happen. And I think they're great. The point is, it's like a pub chat. We all hear there's lots of chat going on. It's all good. In any case, uh, available on all good post co podcasting services. Thanks for listening. Do give feedback on how terrible a job we've done at, uh, at audio describing. Um, <laughs> and, and you can give that feedback through the Discord at garethdennis.co.uk slash Discord. I don't know what it is, although I'm getting there. There are many people who run it. Um, there's a mixture of all sorts. There's lots of fusty old uh, professional railway professionals like me. And there are lots of young people who run it. 
who uh, are, know things about the modern world that I do not. <laughs> you and me so, both, and it's yeah. a happy mixture of all sorts. It's good. Uh, but there's lots of lots of channels for technical stuff, all sorts of very heavy technical discussion going on. Safety channel. There's a channel for career stuff, so CV advice and all sorts of stuff. <clears> New <throat> job opportunities are getting posted in there. It's bonkers how cool it is in there. Uh, also, the Patreon. The Patreon allows me to continue doing this stuff. It also allows me to buy my new... Uh, where is it? Oh, so it's out of reach. I've got a new pocket mic, which allow me to go outside and record things without Ooh. horrible wind noise. So that means I can do a bit more of the old uh, uh, pre-recorded bits for other videos, which is nice. Uh, but Patreon allows you to choose future rail matters, uh, of which one will have to be a comparison with British cities and uh, cities elsewhere in the world on, on mm. public transport that, that of similar sized cities. That, that would be an uncomfortable episode, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, in any case, uh, hopefully everyone's had fun on the bingo. I don't know who's won that. I don't know, you know, the post on Twitter. Um, and uh, you can chuck me money at, if you wish to, either via Patreon or uh, via PayPal as well. And the links, uh, you can find the links on the video uh, and or uh, I've said them in previous episodes, so you probably know what they are already if you're a regular listener. Ah, yes, adverts. So, um, Simon, an advert yeah. for a thing for the young rail professionals. Yes, I'm, I'm a young rail professional. I'm supposedly young um, and um, professional supposedly as well. So um, on Tuesday, the 24th, uh, which is this coming Tuesday, next week, we've got the uh, London South East Committee, of which I'm the chair, is uh, running a sustainable sustainability and rail infrastructure. So ha it just so happened that we did, we were running this kind of sustainability theme in the week that rail, uh, Gareth and I did this rail now because Gareth and I have been talking about this for a while. So mm. this is this is perfectly coincidental, I, I promise. Um, so if you go to the youngrailpro.com, uh, you'll be able to find the events page and sign up for this event. And also we have H regions um, doing all sorts of other good events as well. If you're not a member of YRP, it costs zero pounds. Uh, so sign up for YR, uh, YRP to get access to these events. If you want to get involved with the committee, do it. Uh, I've been with YRP for about two years and I somehow got elected chair. I've no idea why or how that happened, but it did. Um, and then you can uh, do all the boring admin. Um, but also join uh, great events. You can you can spearhead events. We do when COVID's not a thing. Uh, we do Christmas and summer barbecues and stuff like that. So get involved. And obviously, as Gareth is helping us promote uh, YRP, then I should probably, um, yes, yes, woo, uh, shout out Wales, I saw a Discord there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes, I should also say that, obviously, if you're not a Patreon supporter of Gareth, uh, why do it? I do it. It's good. Do it. It's a thing. Um, and you'll see me, uh, you'll, you'll also see me in the chat, Simons of Kendler, on the YouTube. Um, if you want to follow YRP on Twitter, it's at Young Rail Pro, or just search YRP, you should be able to find it. Um, and you can see uh, events popping up on there. We have a LinkedIn, we have a YouTube where our webinars get uploaded if you can't watch them in real time. Um, and is it now I, I talk about my Twitter, Gareth? I might as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, do it. Go on. Yes. So I'm at Simon Zev. That's Simon Z-E-V. It's my weird Jewish Hebrew middle name. Um, ah. uh, at Simon Zev um on twitter so yeah do do follow me for associated transport witcherings it's it's a bit like gareth's but a lot less clever and a, a lot a lot more kind of wibbly basically it's like gareth but gareth's obviously just you know smashing it but um if you want to hear some wibbles from myself then smashing is probably an accurate word yeah particularly on my phone i've lost the use of the n key on my phone since i got a new screen so that that smashing is right. accurate yes <laughs> yeah exactly well i mean gareth and i have been uh, smashing away at silly anti-hs2 people for uh for the best part of a year now i think it was um so uh when that kind of all started happening uh, i've been i've only been on the twitter since the last hst uh with any um ah really just, okay yeah, I had a Twitter account for years and never never really used it. And then I and then um, I met all these lovely people on on the on the HST tour and um, and I people started following me. So I, I thought, oh, I better I better do something with it. And also, um, LNER for the final day of LNER, um, uh, they made a video about the all four days of the HST trip from all the way from Scotland down, which Tim brave Tim and Nigel Harris, an unbelievable job doing all four days. I don't know how yeah, they did it. Um, and uh, of course, you met them at York, and I, I met Tim uh, at Leeds. Uh, did the last day into London, obviously, and um, it was incredible. It was such a great day, and LNR featured me in their video summary of the day, uh, and they featured a bit of body art um, as well. Jeff Marshall did, did as well. On the oh yeah, yeah. Joined yeah. it, so 
Um, it, uh, so I do have a bit of uh, train inspired body art. No, I'm not going to show it to you now. <laughs> yeah, show sure. us. Sure. Sure. Oh, so. oh, okay, okay. Um, that yeah, we've we've got there's some Jewish questioning coming through. Um, oh, Ella, the developer, is asking how you spell what the Hebrew spelling of um, of your middle name is. Oh uh, well, it's it's so Zev is an anglicised version of Zev. Uh, so in Hebrew, you'd spell it Sadik um, Sadik Aleph Vet. Oh, my Hebrew is rusty. Um, in English, you then phonetically write that as Z E apostrophe E V. My parents were kind enough not to give me an apostrophe in my name, um, so they anglicised it to Z E V. Uh, it translates as Wolf. Uh, I am named after my great grandfather, who was born in Romania, and he his he was born Lupu, which comes from Romanian is this weird Slavic Latin mix up. So Lupu, Lupus, as in wolf. exactly right. Um, Bingo. Yes. So he he was known as Zev when he came to Britain. He was in Romania. He 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 got anti-Semitic abuse from his captain. He kind of killed him. Left Romania quite swiftly. Joined the British Army. Came to Britain. And then my grandpa was born in Britain in 1921. My late grandfather. And he's the one who got into from the army. He got fascinated by engineering and trains. Ah. And when my dad was born, not far from where I'm living, where I am right now. Um, there were these N7 tank engines with these old Gresley coaches and my dad would get very excited when he saw them uh, and back in the day in the 50s when my dad uh, when my grandpa used to work on Saturdays because there used to be a, it was like a six day work week back in the factories my dad would would be dropped off by my grandpa at Bethel Green or Finsley Park or Hornsey stations tell the ask the staff just to look after him and give him a sandwich and that was it he was left there six year old kids <laughs> station Gresley A4s and A1s and all sorts of things that sounds and ideal great. And that passed on to me, so that's where the bug comes from. Well, crikey, that's good. Thing. Good grief. Uh, that's. I mean, there is a story, everyone. Crikey, I didn't expect no, that. This ultimate Natter content here. This is great this. for the people who've dipped off uh, towards the end, because a few people have dipped off because they've seen the podcast thing. They've missed out on serious Easter eggs. Um, in any case, uh, we must press on towards the finale, uh, for, which is for, firstly. Um, I'm talking about gadget bands in in the latest uh, issue of Rail Magazine. Here's Rail Magazine. There are railway cuts inevitable if if funding. But well, it's a very good issue. I'd recommend it. But I'm at the back. What am I moaning about? I'm moaning about the blinking Cambridge Autonomous Metro, which is a piece of junk. It's a stupid idea. Uh, there, there, there. Yeah, there's my article. I'm keeping it small face so you can't just pause the video and read it off the thing. Uh, there it is. You should uh, get pick up a copy of Rail and have a read. I also was on um, uh, with Rory Kessan Jones uh, on Tech Tent last week, so um, pick up Tech Tent podcast, uh, and uh, where I talk about um, Hyperloop and how stupid an idea that is, uh, and how it's uh, kind of the most ridiculous iteration of, of gadget bands I've seen, all the hype, uh, and uh, which is relevant because next week's Rail Natter is episode thirty-seven. Why is it so important to tell people that Hyperloop is bad and other silly stories? where I'm not going to talk about specifically why Hyperloop itself is bad, but I'm going to talk about why um, why the broader idea of Hyperloop and other such such things is bad. And, and broadly, I'm going to talk about um, the, new, the, the way that the, the media often portrays stories about transport and how bad a job it does and some of the challenges about that. Uh, and, and I think I'm going to pick about three or four stories and talk through them, aim for a, perhaps a shorter episode. But I'll see you all in the chat for that one. It should be interesting. And it um, only really remains to say... Uh, to, to, to really bid a, a farewell to our, our guest, Simon. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been great. We finally had our, our pub chat, although I, I was only drinking tea and I finished it like an hour ago. So uh, oh, next time. never mind. Um, and your wine's still going, I hope. In any case, everyone uh, who's in the chat, thank you so much. Simon, It's your wine is finished, which is a calamity. So we'll finish this off and you can go and grab some. Uh, my yes. belly's been rumbling, uh, so I'm going to go and have some dinner. Mm. Uh, and uh, I will. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I will see everyone. It's it, all it made both of us to say cheerio, really. Cheerio. Thanks, Simon. Bye. Cheerio.